see what the scripture says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. <clears throat> it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Your Bible might say, and also to the Gentile. Who does the gospel go to first? Don't, don't overthink it. Do you see it? Who does the gospel go to first in the word of God? The Jew. The nation of Israel first and then also to the Greek. You see that? Now, uh, one of the men that was very influential in my life was a man named Mike Moody. His son um, works with me and for me today. His name is Jacob Moody. And from 2001 to 2004, uh, I spent an hour a week with him and we studied the scriptures. And the thing that I remember most about the time that I spent with him in a little library in Randleman, North Carolina, which is the town where our assembly now is, um, the thing I remember most is that he taught me to study the scriptures in such a way. We study the Old Testament and, and then we check our work in the New Testament. Or we look at the New Testament and we check our work in the Old Testament. That's the way he taught me to study the scriptures. And just the way my mom, a mathematician, taught me uh, to see mathematics, right? We've got, we've got three uh, plus uh, seven on this side, uh, which is 10, and I'm going to take 10 and subtract three and get four on this side. However it is, I don't know if I said that equation. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not awake. Let me try it again. I'm going to take seven and subtract four and get three over here, and I'm going to take three and add four over here and get seven. I'm going to check my work. Is that the same thing? What am I doing? Am I awake? I don't even know if I'm getting it right. I got it right? Thanks, Pete. Exactly. Looking for a hand motion. I got a thumbs up. My point is with math, and we don't need to be arrogant about it, but we always know we're right because we can check our work. It's not like one of these, these English professors who say you should do this or you should do that. Like, I know I'm right with math. We're going to check our work. When it comes to studying the Word of God, we need to check our work. We need to understand and make sure that we're right. When I was a young man, not questioning, but I would ask a lot of questions, questions to godly men and women. And I remember as a young man talking and sitting at a place called Sir Pizza in Roundham, North Carolina, and talking to a man named Larry. And I said, Larry, like, where? Like, I, I, I want to see more than just these verses in the New Testament about the rapture. Like, I, I want to, it's a strange concept. Like, the Lord's going to take his people out before the judgment of God. Is that what you're teaching me? Is that what you're telling me? I need to see it in the Old Testament. I want to see that in the Old Testament because I've been taught that if it's in the New Testament, it's going to be in the Old Testament. And if it's in the Old Testament, it's going to be in the New Testament. That's what I've been taught. And, he, and he, here's what he said. He said, have you ever heard of a man named Enoch? Do you know about Enoch? And as soon as he said the name, I, like, I put everything together just in a moment. Yes, of course. The Lord took Enoch alive before the judgment of God. Like I, It made perfect sense. And so often in our, in our study of the Word of God, we want to compare the Old Testament to the New Testament. We don't need a biblical commentary written by Mark Beatty or Stephen Harrell. What we need is to compare the Scriptures to the Scriptures. Yep. The, the Scriptures are going to interpret the Scriptures for us. And when we, when we get this, when we grasp this, we're going to begin to see everything inside the Scriptures. When, when 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says... Christ our Passover, that's going to take me immediately back to Exodus chapter 12. And I'm going to study the Passover lamb, and then I'm going to take those thoughts, like how they, how they took that Passover lamb on the 11th day and sacrificed it on the 14th day, and I'm going to see that whole progression in the last week of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ our Passover. And he's going to be sacrificed on Passover. That's the day that he's going to die. And he's going to be resurrected on the Feast of the First Fruits. And it is showing you that in picture in the Old Testament. And that's the way we study our Bible. Time and time and time again in Scripture. I'm going to go back and forth and compare. The Lord says, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. He said, that manna in the Old Testament, that bread that fell from heaven in the Old Testament, I am the bread of life. And I'm going to go back to the nation of Israel, I'm going to go back and study that man, and it's going to open my eyes to the truth of the scripture. And that's the way we study our Bible. This Old Testament is not dead. This Old Testament is important. This Old Testament is going to bring death to the scripture. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us in these scriptures. Earlier in the week, we heard a young man talking about a passage 
uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ on the Emmaus Road. And, and, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, beginning in the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to expound upon himself in the scriptures, in the Old Testament. These books are there for our learning. These books open our eyes and add depth to the scriptures. You need to know about the book of Nehemiah. You need to know that the book of Judges is the book of the deliverers. It is the book of the saviors. It is the book of the Shepticums. And each one pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Each one shows us what a savior is. In every aspect, in every, in every story of the, Old, of the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ is shining through. And so I have a question for you as we close our time this week talking about identifying the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get one more aspect of what it is to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. This one's going to be about you as we see ourselves as a Savior. We're getting just to one point this morning, one point to walk away with, one point to encourage us with, one point to leave here with. But as we do that, I have a question for you. Where's the gospel in you? We heard our brother Luca talking about the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear that one? Did you hear that one at, at Martinez? Did you ever hear them say the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? We've heard that our whole life. Where's that come from? Is that biblical? We just come up with that? Where's that in the Bible? Where is the gospel first? Don't give me the day of Pentecost. That's the New Testament. I want to see it in the Old Testament. I want to know where the gospel is revealed first. I want to know where in the scriptures the gospel is given for the first time. And we can see it in picture in the Old Testament. <coughs> this is important. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You think it comes about in Acts chapter 2? You think Peter's the first one to ever teach the gospel where he is on that side of the cross of Calvary? But the Old Testament, the Old Testament is filled with the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to turn in your Bibles to one of the most important passages in the scriptures. Not just the Old Testament, but in the scriptures. It's in Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45. I want us to go to Genesis chapter 45. The backstory was given to us a little bit in the Lord's Supper because we saw Judah. We saw Judah in Genesis chapter 43 being the surety. You know, when you study that passage, and I'm not, I'm not planning on talking about that passage, but when you study that passage, I love that passage because Judah stands in the gap. And his motive, his motive is not Benjamin. Anybody ever notice that when you study that passage? Even when he pleads to his brother Joseph, who he doesn't know is his brother at that time. Even when he pleads, his whole mindset is, it's really not about Benjamin. It's really about my father, who loves this boy. And if you want someone to stay back in Egypt, if you want a prisoner, if you want somebody to stay in prison and be in prison for the rest of their life, you take me and you let the boy go. Not because of the boy. Not because of Benjamin. But because of the heart of my father loves him. And that's the gospel in and of itself. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, not the lion of the tribe of Asher. That very heart, that very mindset. And in our arrogance, we, we come to the cross of Calvary and we somehow think this is about you. This is about me. This is about us going from an eternal destination of, of the judgment of God to sitting on a cloud eating a grape for eternity. No, no, my friend. This is about the heart of the Father who desired to save us. The Lord Jesus Christ went and suffered and bled and died, and we are the beneficiary of his work. Just like Benjamin was the beneficiary of Judah's work. This is about my father. This is about my father who endured the suffering of his favorite son, who was ripped and torn apart by wild beasts. And I will not see him suffer anymore. I beg you, he would say to the governor of Egypt, I beg you, you keep me as the ransom. You let my brother go. You let the guilty go, and I'll take his place. This is the gospel in Genesis chapter 43 as well. And Judah stays the gap. I love that story. And we know, we know 
what leads up to Genesis chapter 45. It, it sounds strange to say it, but Joseph is the favorite son. Joseph has the coat of many colors. Joseph is the apple of his father's eye. There's none like him. There's no one like him. I know about Issachar. I know about Asher. I know about Naphtali. I know about Reuben. I know about these sons. But there's one son who is beloved of the father. and His name is Joseph. And Joseph was rejected by his brother. Sound familiar? Joseph was hated because it was so abundantly obvious that the father loved him. The same as the, the story of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They hated him because they knew that the Lord had blessed him. They saw the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus comes to uh, the Lord, or excuse me, Nicodemus comes to the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 3 and says, We know that you're from God because no one could do these things if the Lord were not with them. Peter would say in Acts chapter 2, This same Jesus who is shown to you. By miracles and wonders and signs, who was approved to you by God, you with wicked hands have taken and crucified. Jesus Christ is the chosen one. Jesus Christ is the favorite son of Jacob or Israel, as we know it in the scripture. Jesus Christ is the anointed one. And in the Old Testament, this is pictured by a man named Joseph, who is his father's favorite. And his brothers hated him without cause. And they stuffed it into a pit and they sold it into slavery. And through God's sovereignty, I'm going to say it again, through God's hand and his sovereignty, he took the wicked hearts of men and used it for good. Mm -hmm. Through the dreams, through the rise of, of Joseph uh, from, from, uh, from the pr prison of Pharaoh, to the governor of the land of Egypt. He's going to save the world. Through the hand of one man. His name is Joseph. He's going to feed the world. Through those seven good years. of pain, Through those seven bad years of pain. It's a story and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In and of itself. But in Genesis chapter 45. Everything changes. And Joseph is now going to. Reveal himself to his brothers. Outside of the, this is just my opinion, okay? So don't, you, you don't need to take this down or write this in stone. But outside of the Garden of Gethsemane, there is no other passage in Scripture that has more emotion than Genesis chapter 45. He calls us all of Pharaoh's house to leave him. He is going to reveal himself to his brothers at the end of this tremendous story about a family that's torn apart by the sea and lies. In this story, Joseph says this in Genesis chapter 45. Let's read some verses. Genesis chapter 45. And Joseph could not control himself before them who stood by him. And he cried in verse 1. Calls every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known to his brethren, and he wept aloud in the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh, and Joseph said to his brethren, I am Joseph. And the son that was sold into slavery, the son, the son that was thrown into a pit, the favorite son of Jacob, the one with the coat of many colors, had risen to prosperity and power in Egypt. And he was the governor at the right hand of Pharaoh. And suddenly he looks at his, at his brothers and say, I'm not dead. I'm alive. I'm the governor of Egypt. And he would ask about his father. He would send him back. He would send his brother back with what we might call good news. You know what that good news is? Your son. Your favorite son is not dead, but he's alive. Look at verse 13. You shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, you shall haste and bring down my father here. Look at verse 26. 
And they told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is the governor over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive, and I shall go and see him before I die. You want to talk about good news? You want to talk about good news? Here's good news in the Old Testament. A man whose life had been absolutely destroyed through jealousy and deceit. And he had lived probably at this point decades of his life in mourning and in depression. Suddenly realizes one certain truth. The favorite son is alive. I thought he was dead. But he's alive. And not only is he alive, but he's glorified. And not only is he glorified, but he's the governor of Egypt. He's at the right hand of Pharaoh. That's the good news. You want to talk about where the gospel is first seen in the scriptures? You want to talk about where the spirit of God has planted the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for you to see? In picture form in the Old Testament, you go right here. And you will see for the first time shown to you through picture in the Old Testament, the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My Savior lives. He's not dead in the tomb. He's alive and he's glorified and he's at the right hand of the Father till his enemies be made his footstools. Read it. Where's the gospel? Where's it first seen? Where's the gospel in the Old Testament? If it's in the New, it's in the Old. If it's in the Old, it's in the New. Where is it? It's you. The gospel of Jesus Christ given to us in Genesis chapter 45. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 49. When I was a young man, maybe 2005, maybe I was 24, 25 years old, a man named Mark Beebe began to teach me the scriptures. A little bit deeper, a little bit more. And he made emphasis and placed emphasis on passages in Scripture that I had never seen, honestly. I had never heard. He he began to to teach me, not about John chapter 4, the woman at the well, these passages that we uh, all know so well. But he began to teach me the Scriptures. And he used a certain chapter, a certain chapter in the Old Testament as a compass, as a bookmark, as a road map to the future of the nation of Israel and how to interpret the scriptures. And in my life, I'd never heard a man speak on a chapter. That chapter is Genesis chapter 49. You don't even know it. You don't even have a clue that it's in your Bible. And yet it's one of the most important chapters in all of scripture. I'm going to say that again. Genesis chapter 49 is one of the most important chapters in the entirety of of the canon of scripture. And you ain't read it. And you don't know it. And it's just some page at the end of the, at the, end of the book of Genesis. Here's what's happening in Genesis chapter 49. Here's what's happening. Joseph, excuse me, scratch that. Jacob is recalling actual events from his son's lives. Can you imagine if you went before your father or your mother? At the end of their life, and your dad something, said something like this, Peter, you know, when I think about you in your life, I remember the time that you uh, spilled um, your Coke on your mother's new floor. That's what I remember. Matthew, here's what I remember about you. I remember when you came home with that C on your report card, okay, all because you didn't get your homework done at one night, okay? Stuff like this. It was good and bad, right? And I remember, I remember when you were born, Luke, and I remember how, how happy your mother was when you were born. Whatever the case may be, he's going to go through actual events. He's not recalling things that didn't happen. He's recalling things that did happen. And if you know your scriptures, if you know the Bible, you can go back and see earlier accounts of the book of Genesis on often of what he's talking about in Genesis chapter 49. But in the same light. And through the Spirit of God and the wonder of Scripture, he's also turning into a prophet. 
It's said in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 1, I believe, that Jacob says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to the tribes, what's going to happen to the nation of Israel in the latter days. Do you see that in verse 1, verse 2 right there? So he's, he's recalling actual events that happened in the nation of Israel, and then he's going to bring forth the prophecy of the future of the nation of Israel in one chapter. That's Genesis chapter 49. I think you ought to know it, and you don't. You don't? And if you do, well done. That's what's happened in Genesis chapter 49. And every time we take a character, whether it's Reuben, whether it's Simeon, whether it's Levi, whether it's Judah, whether it's Dan, every time we take a, a, a character, an, an Old Testament tribe, we're going to study it in like fashion. There's a book in the New Testament that goes through Genesis chapter 49, literally statement by statement. I want to say it again. There's a book in the New Testament that goes through Genesis chapter 49, statement by statement. I think Jamie Nicholson, 20 or 30 years ago, wrote an article about this, and it's profound. You know who the book of James is written to? The 12 tribes scattered abroad. That's what it says in, in the book of James. Now, this is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. You know who Genesis chapter 49 is to? The 12 tribes. You know the, the name? Here we go. Here's a little bit more Hebrew for you, okay? Want some Hebrew? Let's, let's have some Hebrew. You know what the, what the name James is in Hebrew? Jacob. That's the translation. So if you're reading a Hebrew New Testament today, I, I would say turn to the book of Jacob. Because the name is the same. So we've got, we've got a, a, a James in the New Testament, but his, his name in Hebrew is Jacob. And we've got a Jacob in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 49. If you go through the book of James, you'll see these statements time and again that come from Genesis chapter 49. Not anything enough. Go read it. Go study it. Go find it yourself. An entire book of the New Testament based on, by the Spirit of God, not by men, Based on Genesis chapter 49. Now today, I want to look at a character in Genesis chapter 49. His name is Nathor. Nathor. He's the sixth son of Jacob. Reuben. Simeon. Levi. Judah. Dan. Nathor. He's the sixth son. We have these stereotypes in our country. It's kind of like he's the middle child. He gets lost in the shelf. You know, you've heard these stereotypes. Like, he's the middle child. He's not the oldest child. He's not the baby. He's just like somewhere in the midst and nobody knows his name. He's like the offensive line of the 12 tribes of Judah. You know, he does the grunt work. He's always there. No one knows his name, but he's pretty doggone important. You know what he thinks? Don't actually tell me. You know anything about Levi in the scriptures? He's one of the 12 tribes. His name will be written on one of the gates of Pearl. You know anything about any clue? Let's talk about the rabbis and the scribes. Because much of Jewish culture is given orally. I'm going to say that again. Much of Jewish culture is given orally. They told stories. And they passed it down from generation to generation. I'm going to tell you how the scribes would recount or recall the story of Genesis chapter 45. Okay? It goes like this. These band of brothers were going back, back to see Jacob, their father, back to bring him good news, incredible news, life-altering news. And according to Jewish oral history, according to the way the story is told by the rabbis even today, one of the brothers saw the tent about a mile away. And when he saw the tent that contained his father, he was moved with emotion, shaking with emotion. And according to the rabbis, according to Jewish tradition, he girded himself up. Don't really know what that means, okay? Much like Elijah. Remember Elijah girding himself up, pulling up his robe? To run, he girded himself up 
and ran a mile and fell at his father's feet and said, Dad, I have news. Good news. News that will change your life. News that you won't believe, but it's true. Your son, your chosen favorite son, Joseph, he's not dead. He's alive. Not only is he alive, Father, hear me, but he's glorified in all of Egypt. And not only that, he's the governor. Second to only Pharaoh himself. That's the good news. That's the life-altering news. And we read in the scriptures that when, when Jacob heard the news, he couldn't believe it. Can you imagine one day? Can you imagine one day? The, the, the very one instance, the very one thing that has defined your life and your sorrows and your agonies for decades, now suddenly is not true. Can you imagine such news? Can you imagine the impact on your life when your night is turned to day? My father, his name is Ben now. You'd like him. He's like said, he said, you would love Ben. He'd talk to each and every one. He could care less about Jewish oral tradition. If you heard that story, if you heard this message, you'd be like, we don't care about what the rabbis say. We care about what the word of God says. And if any in the scriptures, we don't want to hear it. I think it is. I think it is in the word of God. I think this story is found in one verse, in one verse in the scripture. Now the details are not there. Look at Genesis chapter 49. In verse 21. Look at Genesis chapter 49 and verse 21. Now you've got to remember this passage, this chapter denotes actual events, things that happen. Imagine if your father, we've already covered it, imagine if your father said, this is what I remember of all the foolishness, of all the great things, of all the accomplishments of your whole life, Philip. This is what I remember. This is the one memory I have of you, and I will stay with me the rest of my life. Of everything you've ever done, good, bad, or the other, this is what I recall. Look what Joseph says. Excuse me. Look what Jacob says about Naphtali. In Genesis chapter 21 and verse, excuse me, Genesis chapter 49 and verse 21. Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth the beautiful words. I'll say it another way. Naphtali is a deer running fast. And he brought me the wonderful words. I'll say it in Hebrew. You ready for the translation in Hebrew? I'll look at it, okay? Well, I think I need people to help me. You want, Peter, you ready? You want, the, you want the Hebrew? Naphtali is a deer running fast. And he brought me the good news. You want to know where we get the terminology? Good news? We sing it like this when I was a kid at Shen Hill's Bible Chapel. Have you heard the good news? Good news, good news. Have you heard the good news? Good news, good news. Where's that terminology come from? Is that biblical? You better believe it's biblical. And it's right here in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 21. Naphtali, boy, boy, I remember the time you ran fast and you came to me and you brought me good news, life-changing news, beautiful words. In Hebrew, literally, the good news. Oh, boy. Of all the things and all the foolishness of your life, of all the accomplishments in your life, I don't remember, I don't recall any of those things like the time you ran fast and you brought me good news. That's what I recall. Nathalie ran fast at some point in his life and brought Jacob good news. 
If you've ever been through tragedy, if you've ever been through heartache, if you've ever loved anybody, and know the sorrow and the agony of life, and someone comes and tells you that it never really happened, and that your favorite son is alive, that's the day you are. The day that your night, the day that your sorrow, the day that your agony went away. And suddenly, life was seen through a different lens. Good question. The question is this. Where's that prophecy fulfilled? Remember, Genesis 49 is recalling Old Testament actual events in the life of these young men. But, but Jacob at the same time, is prophesying the future of the nation of Israel. That verse is a prophecy. That verse is a reminder of what actually happened. And it's also a prophecy of the future of the nation of Israel. Where does that come to play? Where is that fulfilled? Where does Naphtali bring the good news? Where does Naphtali stand and bring good news? Let me ask you another question. But while we're doing this, turn to the book of Matthew. Where did the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ come from? Where'd they come from? Now, Judas Iscariot was from the tribe of Judah. Did you remember that? Did you remember that Judas Iscariot was from the tribe of Judah? It says that in the scripture, but I'm not coming out with that. Judas Iscariot was from the tribe of Judah. Where did you find those other selfish, blue collar? Rednecks from the back side of Georgia. Where, where did the Lord get them? Let's go. Yeah, the region of which we'll read about. They were fishermen, right? The Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. Right? That very northern region, very uh, western side of the Sea of Galilee. What tribe inherited that land? Was it the tribe of Asher? No. Was it the tribe of Dan? No. Wasn't Reuben. Remember Reuben and, and half the tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Gad were on the other side of the sea uh, of, of the Jordan River. Well, when you, you saw these Bible maps in your Bible, who interpreted that land? What does it say in Matthew's gospel? Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Someone just said that. Which is on the seacoast of the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. That it, might be spoke, uh, that it might be fulfilled by which it was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea. Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them who sat in the region and shadow of death, light is springing up. And from that time, Jesus began to, to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brothers, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. You know where he got his men? You know where he got his boys? You know where his disciples came from? Capernaum, Galilee, Zebulun, Naphtali. Naphtali. Right there by the Sea of Galilee, right there by the inheritance of the tribe of Naphtali is where his disciples came. Go with me again to the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 49 and verse 21. Let's go to Acts Chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, a son stands up. Acts chapter 2, a disciple stands up. Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 is the day that the gospel goes forth. Acts chapter 2 is a time when the gospel goes, for, goes forth for the first time. It doesn't go to the nations. It doesn't go to the Gentiles. It goes to the Jews. 
It goes to Jacob. It goes to Israel on the day of Pentecost. Where did the good news go in Genesis chapter 45? It didn't go to the nations. It didn't go to the Gentiles. It went to Israel first. You see that in the Old Testament? The, the scriptures are never wrong. They're never wrong. He didn't go. Naphtali didn't run to the Gentiles. He didn't run to the Greeks. He ran to Israel and he fell down and he told them the good news. And on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is brought for the first time by a man named Peter who lived in the inheritance of the tribe of Naphtali. And suddenly, Jacob's prophecy is fulfilled in your ear. Suddenly, the Old Testament speaks and the power of God is known because thousands of years ago, an old man named Jacob said, from Naphtali, the good news will come. From Naphtali, the good news will be spoken. From Naphtali, we will hear the truth. And suddenly in Acts chapter 2, a man named Peter from the tribe of Naphtali stands and speaks with power and authority. And he says the same thing as Genesis chapter 49. This same Jesus, this same Son of God, this same chosen one of Israel, this, this Son of the Almighty, which God has approved and shown by miracles and wonders and signs which the world has never seen. This Jesus, which you with wicked hands have slain and crucified, this Jesus Christ is not dead. He is risen by the power of God and is alive. And he is glorified. Read it in Acts chapter 2. He is glorified and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father till his enemies be made his footstool. And about 3,000 heard the gospel and responded. About 3,000 lives were changed because they heard the good news that Jesus Christ can save sinners. Can you understand the power and the sovereignty of the word of God? Guys, we couldn't make these things up if we tried. It is written that we should know that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. It is even prophesied for us in Genesis chapter 49 of which tribe it will speak, of which tribe will stand up a Peter, a man of no reputation, a man from the backside of nowhere, a man that just denied the Lord Jesus Christ but is now full of the Holy Ghost and living through the power of a man who is walking and living in faith, now preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, saying, Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is glorified. And if you read Acts chapter 2, you'll see that Jesus Christ is at the right hand, not a Pharaoh, like Genesis 45, but he's at the right hand of God until his enemies be made his footstool. It has the gospel. And I said all these things to get to one point that I want to make right now. And if you haven't heard anything else I've said since Friday night, hear this. You ready? Hear this. This is what matters to me. This is what we miss. This is what Luca was saying. This is what changes the Christian life. This is what takes religion and boots it out of the yard and comes to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what makes Christianity real. This is what, this is what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, means to us. This is what the Christian life is all about. This is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. And it's represented to us in the Old Testament through a man's heart and a man's zeal named Naphtali. This is what I want to say. This is what it is to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. To have zeal for the gospel. Not because your Sunday school teacher said to leave a track on the table. Not because you went in the bathroom and left one by the sink. Not because you have a cookie cutter thing to say to someone. Because your, your assembly told you to give the gospel. Throw all of it out. And hear this. Hear this. When he was about a mile away. He was gripped and moved with emotion. Because he knew. Because he knew one thing. 
if my father, my father, who has wept and mourned and depressed for decades, if my father, who has mourned Joseph, like we never could have imagined, if my father believes the good news, his life will change. If he believes that Joseph, which I have seen with my own eyes, if he believes that Joseph is alive and glorified and the governor of Egypt, if he can just grasp it and believe it and know the truth that is through my testimony, his life will change forever. Oh, if you would believe. That, my friends, is what we are missing today. It is the zeal of the gospel, which is this unbeliever that works at Target, which is this unbeliever that is our postman, which is this unbeliever that teaches our chemistry class at school, whatever the case may be. Mr. Green, from our conversation, if this, if this lost individual would simply believe in Jesus Christ, if this lost individual would simply understand that my God, that my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was dead in the tomb for three days, arose again and is alive and glorified in heaven and at the right hand of the Father, if they would simply believe, their life would change and they would have hope Instead of hoping in nothing, instead of hopelessness, instead of suicide, instead of skittles and video games, if he would just grasp, if he would just believe, if he would just take the, the gospel that Jesus Christ is the true Son of God, and, and you can have the forgiveness of sins and a clear conscience and be grafted into the family of God and made the bride of Christ, if they would just believe in the gospel, their life would change. That's the story of Naphtali. He was gripped with emotion. He was gripped with the zeal of the gospel. He knew what it would mean if his father would just believe. Just believe. Just believe in your night will turn to day. Just believe and you'll be a new creation. Just believe and have hope. That's the gospel we preach. To identify with the Lord Jesus Christ is to walk follow him. To identify with the Lord Jesus Christ is to live biblical faith and have biblical faith. To identify with the Lord Jesus Christ is to be submissive to the will and the word of God. To be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ is to live the reality and the zeal of Naphtali. That's what it means. And we have dumbed the gospel of Jesus Christ down to leaving tracks in the bathroom. No, 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 man, my friend. It changes lives. Do you hear me? And we don't speak these things because it, it's the reality of some old religious book. We speak these things with power and truth because the gospel has changed my life. Because the gospel has made me whole. Because I know the forgiveness of sins. Because I sleep in the bed knowing the forgiveness of sins, knowing a clean conscience. Knowing that God has loved me to the point of death in the form of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know the forgiveness of sins. And it's changed my life. And it's, and, it's, and it's made me a new creation. And I live in the wonder and the reality of the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have forgotten the zeal of that life. We have forgotten what it means when someone believes. Identify with an afterlife. He's identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. His disciples say to this. His disciples. His disciples believe. And their lives and this world has never been the same. That's the truth. I'll give you one more verse. Or 
practical application, but we got to go back to Genesis chapter 49. Found in 1 Kings. It's found in the New Testament. It's found all over the scripture. You no know one pays attention. No one studies. No one sees these three little words. <clears throat> Sorry, not Genesis 49, Genesis 45. Three little words that are, that are the reality of the believer. Three little words that are our anthem, that are our theme. Three little words that we need to be reminded of when the trials and the struggles of life come, and they will, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. The call to change, the diagnosis, a life-altering event maybe around, maybe around the table, maybe around the turn, maybe around the bend. But I want, you, I want you to hear three words. Three words and a new reality of a man's life who has been changed because he believed the gospel. Because he believed that the chosen of Jacob, that the chosen of Israel is alive and glorified and at the right hand of David. He said three words. Three words that we need to leave here with. Three words that need, we need to remind each other of when times and struggles have come. Genesis chapter 45 and verse 28. This is after the reality. This is after the change. This is after he believed. And Jacob said, or the Bible translated, translates it this way, and Israel said, it is enough. Just three words. It's enough. And I don't, I don't want to come across as uncompassionate. And I don't want to come across as arrogant. And I don't want to come across as a know-it-all. But I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what you're going through. You want, you want to hear a sad story? You want to hear mine? You want to hear my story? You want to hear about consequences of sin? You want to hear my story? The man that taught me the scripture is the same as Mark Eden. You know what he lines? He lines says, everybody's got a story. You want to tell me about your grandpa who's an alcoholic? You want to tell me about your dad who cheated on your mom? You want to tell me about your life that hasn't worked out the way it's supposed to work out? You want to tell me about that job that you were so close to getting, but you didn't get? You want to tell me about that relationship that didn't work out? You want to tell me about whatever the, the story of your life is? Here's what I know. Jesus Christ has saved your soul. Jesus Christ loves you unto death. Jesus Christ has redeemed you and bought you back if you believe the gospel. And that, my friend, uh, I, don't, I don't mean it. I don't mean it in a light way, but that, my friend, is enough for you. It's enough for you mentally. It's enough for your reality. It's enough for your emotions. It's enough to bring you hope. It's enough to change your night today. I know. You, you want to talk about my life, Clark? You want to hear about my life? You want to hear about the sin and the consequences of, men, of my life? Here's what I'll tell you. Jesus Christ is enough for you. Jesus Christ and the gospel of truth is enough to give me hope. No matter the circumstance, no matter the consequences, no matter the struggles and the issues, and I know they are great in your life, Jesus Christ is enough for you. Believe the gospel. Know the truth. And let it permeate in your life. We don't dwell on the consequences of sin. We don't remember our sin. Kyle read from, from Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, the Lord's Supper. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 3 says, In those sins, Talks about those Old Testament sins and sacrifices. Excuse me, it says sacrifices. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 3. In those sacrifices is a remembrance of sin every year. We didn't come here this morning and break bread and take the cup and remember sin. Like those Old Testament sacrifices. We came here and we broke bread and we took the cup and we remember Jesus Christ. 
cleanses us from all unrighteousness and gives us a sure hope. And that, my friend, no matter the struggle, no matter your story, no matter the heartbreak, though it be awful, no matter the struggle, though it be great, no matter the circumstance in your life, the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and glorified and at the right hand of the Father till his enemies be made his footstool, that is enough for you. That is enough. Get your mind off yourself. Change your mind from the cultural aspect of yourself. Get your mind off your selfishness and your heart and your mind and where you want to go and focus, recalibrate, re <clears throat> refocus your mind to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and know that all that you have in this world is the Lord Jesus Christ and his promises. You want to talk about money? I know about money. You know about dividends and stocks and calls and puts? I know about money. You want to talk about real estate? I know about real estate. You want to talk about it? We'll talk about it. Here's what I know. All these things shall go away. And what you have is but one thing. And they are the promises and the word of the Lord Jesus Christ and they are yea and amen. That's what you have. Bank on that. Rest on that. Enjoy that. It's enough for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, simple thoughts about a man in the Old Testament who just simply shows us how we ought to live and how we ought to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we confess, we confess today that I and that we we have forgotten the zeal of Nakai. We have forgotten that the gospel changes lives and gives those that are on their way to hell and gives those that are emotionally wrecked and hopeless and floundering in this culture new life, a different perspective, and the forgiveness of sins. Father, we confess how quick we are to wander away from the glorious message of the gospel which changes lives. We don't want to go to 3.4 billion and leave a track. We want to go to 3.4 billion and tell them that if they believe, Jesus Christ will save them. Jesus Christ will change their life. Jesus Christ will make them a new creation. Jesus Christ will give them the forgiveness of sins through faith in him. We pray in his name.